Short Stories by O. Henry. 3. After 20 years, the policeman on the beat moved up the avenue impressively. The impressiveness was habitual and not for show, for spectators were few. The time was barely ten o'clock at night, but chilly gusts of wind, with a taste of rain in them, had well nigh depeopled the streets. Trying doors as he went, twirling his club with many intricate and artful movements, turning now then to the cast his watchful eye down the Pacific thoroughfare, the officer with his stalwart form and slight swagger made a fine picture of a guardian of the peace. The vicinity was one that kept early hours. Now and then you might see the light of a cigar store or an all-night lunch counter, but the majority of the doors belonged to business places that had long since been closed. When about midway of a certain block, the policeman suddenly slowed his walk. In the doorway of a darkened hardware store, a man leaned, with an unlighted cigar in his mouth. As the policeman walked up to him, the man spoke up quickly. "'It's all right, officer,' he said reassuringly. "'I'm just waiting for a friend. "'It's an appointment made twenty years ago. "'Sounds a little funny to you, doesn't it? "'Well, I'll explain, if you'd like to make certain it's all right. "'About that long ago, there used to be a restaurant where this store stands, "'Big Joe Brady's Restaurant.' "'Until five years ago,' said the policeman. "'It was torn down then.' "'The man in the doorway struck a match.' and lit his cigar. The light showed a pale, square-jawed face with keen eyes, a little white scar near his right eyebrow. His scarf-pin was a large diamond, oddly set. Twenty years ago tonight, said the man, I dined here at Big Joe Brady's with Jimmy Wells, my best chum and the finest champ in the world. He and I were raised here in New York, just like two brothers together. I was eighteen and Jimmy was twenty. The next morning, I was to start for the West to make my fortune. You couldn't have dragged Jimmy out of New York. He thought it was the only place on earth. Well, we agreed that night that we would meet here again exactly twenty years from that date and time, no matter what our conditions might be or from what distance we might have to come. We figured that in twenty years each of us ought to have our destiny worked out and our fortune made, whatever they were going to be. It sounds pretty interesting, said the policeman. Rather a long time between meets, though, it seems to me. Haven't you heard from your friends since you left? Well, yes, for a time we corresponded, said the other. But after a year or two we lost track of each other. You see, the West is a pretty big proportion, and I kept hustling around over it pretty lively. But I know Jimmy will meet me here if he's alive, for he always was the truest, staunchest old chum in the world. He'll never forget. I came a thousand miles to stand in this doorway tonight, and it's worth it if my old pal turns up. The waiting man pulled out a handsome watch the lid of it set with small diamonds. Three minutes to ten, he announced. It was exactly ten o'clock when we parted here at the restaurant door. Did pretty well out west, didn't you? asked the policeman. You bet. I hope Jimmy has done half as well. He was a kind of plotter, though good fellow as he was. I've had to compete with some of the sharpest wits going to get my pile. A man gets it in a groove in New York. It takes the West to put a razor edge on him. The policeman twirled his club and took a step or two. I'll be going on my way. Hope your friend comes around all right. Going to call time on him sharp? I should say not, said the other. I'll give him half an hour at least. If Jimmy is alive on earth, he'll be here by that time. So long, officer. "'Good night, sir,' said the policeman, passing on along his beat, trying doors as he went. There was now a fine cold drizzle falling, and the wind had risen from its uncertain puff into a steady blow. 
The few foot passengers astir in that quarter hurried dismay and silently along with coat collars turned high and pocketed hands, and in the door of the hardware store the man who had come a thousand miles to fill an appointment, uncertain almost to absurdity, with the friend of his youth, smoked his cigar and waited. About twenty minutes he waited, and then a tall man in a long overcoat, with collar turned up to his ears, hurried across from the opposite side of the street. He went directly to the waiting man. "'Is that you, Bob?' he asked doubtfully. "'Is that you, Jimmy Wells?' cried the man in the door. "'Bless my heart!' exclaimed the new arrival, grasping both the other's hands with his own. "'It's Bob, sure as fate. I was certain I'd find you here if you were still in existence. Well, 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 twenty years is a long time. The old restaurant's gone, Bob. I wish it had lasted, so we could have had another dinner there. How was the West treating you, my friend? Bully, it has given me everything I asked for it. You've changed lots, Jimmy. I never thought you were so tall by two or three inches. Oh, I grew a bit after I was twenty. Doing well in New York, Jimmy? Moderately. I have a position in one of the city departments. Come on, Bob. We'll go round to a place I know of and have a good long talk about old times. The two men started up the street arm in arm. The man from the West, his egotism enlarged by success, was beginning to outline the history of his career. The other, submerged in his overcoat, listened with interest. At the corner stood a drug store, brilliant with electric lights. When they came into the glare, each of them turned simultaneously to gaze upon the other's face. The man from the West stopped suddenly and released his arm. "'You're not Jimmy Wells,' he snapped. Twenty years is a long time, but not long enough to change a man's nose from a Roman to a pug. "'It sometimes changes a good man into a bad one,' said the tall man. "'You've been under arrest for ten minutes, Silky Bob. "'Chicago thinks you may have dropped over our way "'and wires us. "'She wants us to have a chat with you. "'Going quietly, are you? "'It's sensible. "'Now, before we go to the station, here's a note. "'I was asked to hand to you. "'You may read it here at the window. "'It's from Patrolman Wells.' "'The man from the West unfolded the little piece of paper handed him. His hand was steady when he had began to read, but it trembled a little by the time he had finished. The note was rather short. Bob, I was at the appointed place on time. When you struck the match to light your cigar, I saw it with the face of a man wanted in Chicago. Somehow I couldn't do it myself, so I went around and got a plain clothesman to do the job. Jimmy. THE RETRIEVED REFORMATION A guard came to the prison shoe shop, where Jimmy Valentine was assiduously stitching uppers, and escorted him to the front office. There the warden handed Jimmy his pardon, which had been signed that morning by the governor. Jimmy took it in a tired kind of way. He had served nearly ten months of a four-year sentence. He had expected to stay only about three months at the longest. When a man with as many friends on the outside as Jimmy Valentine had is received in stir, it is hardly worth while to cut his hair. Now, Valentine, said the warden, you'll go out in the morning, brace up and make a man of yourself. You're not a bad fellow at heart. Stop cracking safes and live straight. Me, said Jimmy in surprise. Why, I never cracked a safe in my life. Oh, no, laughed the warden. Of course not. Let's see now. How was it you happened to get sent up on that Springfield job? Was it because you wouldn't prove an alibi for fear of compromising somebody in extremely high-toned society, or was it simply a case of a mean old jury that had it in for you? It's always one or the other with you innocent victims. Me, said Jimmy, still blankly virtuous. Why, warden, I never was in Springfield in my life. Take him back, Crone, said the warden, smiling. 
and fix him up with outgoing clothes. Unlock him at seven in the morning and let him come to the bullpen. Better think it over. At a quarter past seven on the next morning, Jimmy stood in the warden's outer office. He had on a suit of villainously fitting, ready-made clothes and a pair of stiff, squeaky shoes that the state furnished to its discharge compulsory guests. The clerk handed him a railroad ticket and five-dollar bill with which the law expected him to be rehabilitating himself into a good citizenship and prosperity. The warden gave him a cigar and shook hands. Valentine, 9,762, was chronicled in the books, pardoned by the governor, and Mr. James Valentine walked out into the sunshine. Disregarding the song of the birds, the waving green trees, and the smell of flowers, Jimmy headed straight for a restaurant. There he tasted the sweet joy of liberty in the shape of a broiled chicken and a bottle of white wine, followed by a cigar a grade better than the one the warden had given him. From there he proceeded leisurely to the depot. He tossed a quarter into the hat of a blind man sitting by the door and boarded his train. Three hours set him down in a little town near the state line. He went to the cafe of one Mike Dolan and shook hands with Mike, who was alone behind the bar. "'Sorry we couldn't make it sooner, Jimmy, me boy,' said Mike. "'But we had that protest from Springfield. "'And the governor nearly balked. "'Feeling any better?' "'Fine,' said Jimmy. "'Got my key?' He got his key and went upstairs, unlocking the door of a room at the rear. Everything was just as he had left it. There on the floor was still Ben Price's collar button that had been torn off from the eminent detective's shirt band when they had overpowered Jimmy to arrest him. Pulling out from the wall a folding bed, Jimmy slid back a panel in the wall and dragged out a dust-covered suitcase. He opened this and gazed fondly at the finest set of burglar tools in the East. It was a complete set, made of specially tempered steel, the latest design in drills, punches, braces, and bits, Jimmy's clamps and augers, with two or three novelties invented by Jimmy himself, in which he took pride. Over nine hundred dollars they had cost him to have made it. A place where they make such things for the profession. In half an hour Jimmy went downstairs and through the cafe. He was now dressed in a tasteful, well-fitting clothes, and carried his dusted and cleaned suitcase in his hand. "'Got anything on?' asked Mike Dolan genially. "'Me?' said Jimmy, in a puzzled tone. "'I don't understand. I'm representing the New York Amalgamated Short Snap Biscuit Cracker and Fizzled Wheat Company.' This statement delighted Mike to such an extent that Jimmy had to take a seltzer and milk on the spot. He never touched hard drinks. A week after the release of Valentine, 9,762, there was a neat job of safe burglary done in Richmond, Indiana, with no clue to the author. A scant $800 was all that was secured. Two weeks after that a patent patented, improved burglar-proof safe in Langsport was opened like a cheese to the tune of $1,500, currency securities and silver untouched. That began to interest the rogue catchers. Then an old-fashioned bank safe in Jefferson City became active and threw out of its crater an eruption of banknotes amounting to $5,000. The loss were now high enough to bring the matter up into Ben Price's class of work. By comparing notes, a remarkable similarity in the methods of the burglaries was noticed. Ben Price investigated the scene of robberies and was heard to remark, That's dandy Jim Valentine's autograph. He's resumed business. Look at this combination knob, jerked out as easy as pulling up radishes in a wet weather. He's got the only clamps that can do it. And look how clean these tumblers were punched out. Jimmy never has to drill more than one hole. Yes, I guess I want Mr. Valentine. He'll do his bit next time without any short time or clemency foolishness. Ben Price knew Jimmy's habits. 
He had learned them while working on the Springfield case. Long jumps, quick getaways, no confederates, and a taste for good society. These ways had helped Mr. Valentine to become noted as a successful dodger of retribution. It was given out that Ben Price had taken up the trail of the elusive cracksman, and other people with burglar-proof safes felt more at ease. One afternoon, Jimmy Valentine and his suitcase climbed out of the mail hack in Elmore, a little town five miles off the railroad down in the Black Jack country of Arkansas. Jimmy, looking like an athletic young senior, just home from college, went down the boardwalk towards the hotel. A young lady crossed the street, passed him at the corner, and entered a door over which was the sign of Elmore Bank. Jimmy Valentine looked into her eyes, forgot what he was, and became another man. She lowered her eyes and colored slightly. Young men of Jimmy's style and looks were scarce in Elmore. Jimmy collared a boy that was loafing on the steps of the bank, as if he were one of the stockholders, and began to ask him questions about the town, feeding him dimes at intervals. By and by, the young lady came out, looking royally unconscious of the young man, with the suitcase, and went her way. "'Isn't that young lady Miss Polly Simpson?' asked Jimmy, with a suspicious guile. "No," nah, said the boy. "'She's Annabelle Adams.' Her pa owns this bank. What do you come to Elmore for? Is there a gold watch chain you got? I'm going to get a bulldog. Got any more dimes? Jimmy went to the Planters Hotel, registered as Ralph D. Spencer, and engaged a room. He, learnt, he leaned on the desk and declared his platform to the clerk. He said he had come to Elmore to look for a location to go into business. How was the shoe business now in this town? He had thought of the shoe business. Was there an opening? The clerk was impressed by the clothes and manner of Jimmy. He himself was something of a pattern of fashion to the thinly gilded youth of Elmore, but he now perceived his shortcomings. While trying to figure out Jimmy's manner of tying his foreign hand, he cordially gave information. Yes, there ought to be a good opening for a shoe line. There wasn't any exclusive shoe store in the place. The dry goods and general store handled them. Business in all lines was fairly good. Hoped Mr. Spencer would decide to locate in Elmore. He would find it a pleasant town to live in, and the people very sociable. Mr. Spencer thought it would stop Mr. Spencer thought he would stop over in the town a few days and look over the situation. No, the clerk needn't call the boy. He would carry his own suitcase himself. It was rather heavy. Mr. Ralph Spencer, the phoenix that arose from Jimmy Valentine's ashes, ashes left by the flame of sudden attack of love, remained in Elmore and prospered. He opened a shoe store and secured a good run of trade. Socially, he was also a success and made many friends, and he accomplished the wish of his heart. He met Miss Annabel Adams and became more and more captivated by her charms. At the end of a year, the situation of Mr. Ralph Spencer was this. He had won the respect of the community. His shoe store was flourishing, and he and Annabel were engaged to be married in two weeks. Mr. Adams, the typical plodding country banker, approved of Spencer. Annabel's pride in him almost equaled her affection. He was as much at home in the family of Mr. Adams and that of Annabel's married sister as he were already a member. One day, Jimmy sat down in his room and wrote this letter, which he mailed to the safe address of one of his old friends in St. Louis. Dear old pal, I want you to be at Sullivan's place in Little Rock next Wednesday. At nine o'clock, I want you to wind up some little matters for me, and also I want to make you a present of my kit of tools. I know you'll be glad to get them. You couldn't duplicate the lot for a thousand dollars. Say, Billy, I've quite the old business. A year ago, I've got a nice store. 
I'm making an honest living, and I'm going to marry the finest girl on earth two weeks from now. It's the only life, Billy, the straight one. I wouldn't touch a dollar of another man's money now for a million. After I get married, I'm going to sell out and go west, where there won't be so much danger of having old scores brought up against me. I tell you, Billy, she's an angel. She believes in me, and I wouldn't do another crooked thing for the whole world. Be sure to be at Sully's, for I must see you. I'll bring along the tools with me. Your old friend, Jimmy. On the Monday night after Jimmy wrote this letter, Ben Price jogged unobtrusively into Elmore in a little buggy. He lounged about town in his odd way until he found out what he wanted to know. From the drug store across the street from Spencer's shoe store, he got a good look at Ralph D. Spencer. "'Going to marry the banker's daughter, are you, Jimmy?' said Ben to himself softly. "'Well, I don't know.' The next morning, Jimmy took breakfast at the Adams. He was going to Little Rock that day to order his wedding suit and buy something nice for Annabelle. That would be the first time he had left town since he came to Elmore. He had been more than a year now since these last professional jobs had taken place, and he thought he could safely venture out. The next morning, Jimmy took breakfast at the Adams. He was going to Little Rock that day to order his wedding suit and buy something nice for Annabelle. That would be the first time he had left town since he came to Elmore. It had been more than a year now since those little professional jobs had taken place, and he thought he could safely venture out. After breakfast, quite a family party went downtown together. Mr. Adams, Annabelle, Jimmy, and Annabelle's married sister and her two little girls, aged five and nine. They came by the hotel where Jimmy still boarded, and ran up to his room and brought along his suitcase. Then they went on to the bank. There stood Jimmy's horse and buggy, and Dolph Gibson, who was going to drive him over to the railroad station. All went inside, the high-carved oak railing into the banking room, Jimmy included, for Mr. Adams' future son-in-law was welcome anywhere the clerks were pleased to be greeted by the good-looking, agreeable young man who was going to marry Miss Annabel. Jimmy set his suitcase down. Annabel, whose heart was bubbling with happiness and lively youth, put on Jimmy's hat and picked up the suitcase. "'Wouldn't I make a nice drummer?' said Annabel. "'My, Ralph, how heavy it is! Feels like it was full of gold bricks!' "'Lot of nickel-plated shoehorns in there,' said Jimmy coolly, "'that I'm going to return. "'Thought I'd save express charges by taking them myself. "'I'm getting awfully economical.' "'The Elmore Bank had just put in a new safe and vault. "'Mr. Adams was very proud of it and insisted on an inspection by everyone. "'The vault was a small one, but it had a new patented door. "'It fastened with three solid steel bolts.' thrown simultaneously with a single handle, and had a time lock. Mr. Adams, beaming, explained its workings to Mr. Spencer, who showed a courteous but not too intelligent interest. The two children, May and Agatha, were delighted by the shining metal and funny clock and knobs. While they were thus engaged, Ben Price sauntered in and leaned on his elbow, looking casually inside between the railings. He stood. Uh, he told the teller that he didn't want anything. He was just waiting for a man he knew. Suddenly there was a scream or two from the women and a commotion. Unperceived by the elders, May, the nine-year-old girl in a spirit of play, had shut Agatha in the vault. She had then shot the bolts and turned the knob of the combination, as she had seen Mr. Adams do. The old banker sprang and tugged at the handle. The door can't be opened, he groaned. The clock hasn't been wound, nor the combination set. Agatha's mother screamed again hysterically. Hush, said Mr. Adams, raising his trembling hand. I'll be quiet for a moment. Agatha, he called as loudly as he could. Listen to me. During the following silence, they could just hear the faint sound of the child wildly shrieking in the dark vault in panic and terror. 
My precious darling, wailed the mother. She will die of fright. Open the door. Oh, break it down. Can't you do something, you men? There isn't a man nearer than Little Rock who can open the door, said Mr. Adams in a shaky voice. What shall we do? What, what will become of the child? She can't stand it for much longer. There isn't enough air, and besides, she'll go into convulsions from fright. Agatha's mother, frantic now, beat the door of the vault with her hands. Somebody wildly suggested dynamite. Annabel turned to Jimmy, her large eyes full of anguish, but not yet despairing. To a woman, nothing seems quite impossible to the powers of the man she loves. Can't you do something, Ralph? Try, won't you? He looked at her with an odd, soft smile on his lips, and in his keen eyes. Annabel, he said, give me that rose you are wearing, will you? Hardly believing that she heard him aright, she unpinned the bud from her dress and placed it in his hand. Jimmy stuffed it into his vest pocket, threw off his coat, and pulled up his shirt sleeves. With that act, Ralph D. Spencer passed away, and Jimmy Valentine took his place. "'Get away from the door, all of you,' he commanded shortly. He set his suitcase on the table and opened it out flat. From that time on, he seemed to be unconscious of the presence of anyone else. He laid out the shining, odd instruments swiftly and orderly, whistling softly to himself, as he always did when at work. In a deep silence and an immovable, the others watched him as if under a spell. In a minute, Jimmy's pet drill was biting smoothly into the steel door. In ten minutes, breaking his own burglar record, he threw back the bolts and opened the door. Agatha, almost collapsed but safe, was gathered into her mother's arms. Jimmy Valentine put on his coat and walked outside, the railings towards the front door. As he went, he thought he heard a faraway voice that he once knew call Ralph, but he never hesitated. At the door, a big man stood somewhat in his way. Hello, Ben. And Jimmy, still with his strange smile, Get around at last, have you? Well, let's go. I don't know that it makes much difference now. And then Ben Price acted rather strangely. Guess you're mistaken, Mr. Spencer, he said. I don't believe I recognize you. Your buggy's waiting for you, ain't it? And Ben Price turned and strolled down the street. A Newspaper Story at 8 a.m., it lay on Giuseppe's newsstand, still damp from the presses. Giuseppe, in his cunning way, philandered on the opposite corner, leaving his patrons to help themselves, no doubt on a theory related to the hypothesis of the watched pot. This particular newspaper was, according to its custom and design, an educator, a guide, a mentor, and a champion, a household counselor, and a vidaicum. From its many excellences might be selected three editorials. One was in simple, chaste, but illuminating language directed to parents and teachers, deprecating corporal punishment for children. Another was an accusive and significant warning addressed to a notorious labor leader who was on the point of instigating his clients to a troublesome strike. The third was the eloquent demand that the police force be sustained and aided in everything that tended to increase its efficacy as public guardian and servants. Besides these more important chidings and requisitions upon the store of good citizenship was a wise and prescription or form of procedure laid out by the editor of the heart-to-heart -heart column in the specific case of a young man who had complained of the obscuracy of his lady love teaching him how he might win her Again, there was on the beauty page a complete answer to a young lady's inquiring who desired admonition towards the securing of bright eyes, rosy cheeks, and a beautiful complexion. Dear Jack, forgive me, you were right. Meet me at the corner of Madison and 8th at 8.30 this morning. 
We leave at noon, penitent. At eight o'clock a young man with a haggard look and a feverish gleam of unrest in his eye dropped a penny and picked up the top paper as he passed Giuseppe's stand. A sleepless night had left him a late riser. There was an office to be reached by nine and a shave and a hasty cup of coffee to be crowded into the interval. He visited his barber shop and then hurried on his way. He pocketed his paper, meditating a belated perusal of it at the luncheon hour. At the next corner it fell from his pocket, carrying with it his pair of new gloves. Three blocks he walked, missed the gloves, and turned back fuming. Just on the half hour he reached the corner where lay the gloves and paper, but he strangely ignored that which he had come to seek. He was holding two little hands as tightly as ever he could, and looking into two penitent brown eyes, while joy rioted in his heart. "'Dear Jack,' she said, "'I knew you would be here on time.' "'I wonder what she means by that,' he was saying to himself. "'But it's all right, it's all right.' A big wind puffed out of the west, picked up the paper from the sidewalk, and— opened it and set it flying and whirling down a side street, up the street, driving a skirtish bay to a spider wheel buggy, and the young man, who had written to the heart-to-heart -heart editorial for a recipe that he might win her for whom he sighed. The wind, with a prankish flurry, flapped and flying newspaper against the face of a skittish bay, there was a lengthened streak of bay mingling with the red of running gear and stretched itself out for four blocks. Then a water hydrant played its part in the cosmogony. The buggy became no match, and the driver rested very quietly where he had flung on the asphalt in front of a certain brownstone mansion. They came out and had him inside very promptly, and there was one who made himself a pillow for his head and cared for no curious eyes, bending over and saying, Oh, it was you, it was you all the time, Bobby. Couldn't you see it? And if you die, why so must I, and... But in all this wind, we must hurry to keep in touch with the, our paper. Policeman O'Brien arrested it as a character dangerous to traffic, straightened its disheveled leaves with his big, slow fingers. He stood a few feet from the family entrance of the Shandon Bell's Café. One headline he spelled out ponderously, the papers to the front in a move to help the police. But whist, the voice of Danny, the head bartender from the crack of the door, Here's a nip for you, Mike, old man. Behind the widespread columns of the press, Policeman O'Brien receives swiftly his nip of real stuff. He moves away, stalwart, refreshed, fortified, to his duties. Might not the editor man view, with pride and the early, the spiritual, the literal fruit that had blessed his labors? Policeman O'Brien folded the paper and poked it playfully under his arm, a small boy that was passing. The boy was named Johnny, and he took the paper home with him. His sister was named Gladys, and she had written to the beauty editor of the paper asking for the particular touch of beauty. That was weeks ago, and she had ceased to look for an answer. Gladys was a pale girl with dull eyes and discontinent expression. She was dressing to go out to the avenue to get some braid. Beneath her skirt, she pinned two leaves of the paper Johnny had brought. When she walked, the rustling sound was an exact imitation of the real thing. On the street, she met Miss Brown, girl from the flat below, and stopped to talk. The girl turned green with envy. Only silk at five dollars a yard could make that sound that she heard from Gladys's as she moved. The brown girl, consumed by jealousy, said something spiteful and went her way with pinched lips. Gladys proceeded towards the avenue. Her eyes now sparkled with jagger fountains. 
A rosy bloom visited her cheeks. A triumphant, subtle, vivifying smile transfigured her face. She was beautiful. Could the beauty editor have seen her then? There was something in her answer to the paper, I believe, about cultivating a kind feeling towards others in order to make plain features attractive. The labor leader, again, whom the against whom the paper's solemn and weighty editorial injunction was laid was the father of Gladys's and Johnny. He picked up the remaining journal from which Gladys had removed the papers. But instead of it was greeted by one of those ingenious and spacious puzzle problems that enthrall alike the simpleton and the, sta and the sage. The labor leader tore off half of the page, provided himself with table, pencil, and paper, and glued himself to the puzzle. Three hours later, after waiting vainly for him at the appointed place, other more conservative leaders declared and ruled in favor of arbitration, and the strike, with its attendant dangers, was averted. Subsequent editions of the paper referred, in colored ink, to the clarion tone of its successful denunciation of the labor leader's intended designs. The remaining leaves of the attractive journal also went loyally to the proving of its potency. When Johnny returned from school, he sought a secluded spot and removed the missing columns from inside his clothing, where they had been artfully distributed so as to successfully defend such areas as are generally attracted during a scholastic castigation. Johnny attended a private school and had had trouble with his teacher, as has been said, there was an excellent editorial against corporal punishment in the morning issue, and no doubt it had its effect. After this, can anyone doubt the power of the press?